beautiful Sunday. Would you stand and join us in worship? I'm just gonna pray us in. Uh, it's so good to be here. We're actually guests from different churches. So this is my buddy Oscar on guitar. Oscar is from New Life Pomona Church and this is Dylan White on Cajon. And uh, me and Dylan, uh, my name is Zoe. We're from Vineyard Pomona. Uh, but this church is so near and dear to my heart. I actually grew up at this church and uh, I spent my childhood here. I have special memories with these people. Um, and I'm so excited to get to worship you. And I know that the presence of God is in this room right now. And so let's just pray and posture our hearts, prepare ourselves to come, to come and worship him this day. So Lord, we honor you. We honor your presence in this place. We thank you for who you are, that you are so good, you are faithful, you're our heavenly father. And Lord, we say that we love you. We love you, we love you. We pray that these songs, Lord, that you would come, you would inhabit our praise in this day, Lord, that you would receive the praise that you're so due, Lord, you're so worthy of. Lord, we wanna come into your courts with thanksgiving, your courts with praise, and know that you are here to meet with us this day, Lord. Give us eyes to see you, give us ears to hear your voice, Lord. We desperately long for you, we cry out for you, Lord, in this day, and we say all the glory is yours, all the honor is yours, all the power forever and ever belongs to you. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. Let us worship.
is actually the word penim. Everybody say penim. Really fun word to say. So you know, you know, a new vocabulary word. <laughs> but that word actually means presence and Hebrew means like face. And it's a close relational word meaning to seek his face. And so yes, his presence is here. He never fails to show himself, to show up. But we play an active part to seek, amen. To come before him and to say, Lord, I'm after your heart. I want to seek your face. I want to see your holiness. I want to know your love deeper. If that's you, I'm just going to call you in that you posture yourselves. Maybe it means holding out your hands like this. Maybe it means already getting into that place where you're just bowing on your knees. If you need to do a holy cartwheel in the back, that's fine too. Let's just come. Let's worship and seek his face.
sing this is it a fragrance dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. Let me say that again. This is God's word. Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. Are you dwelling this morning? Are you dwelling? Have you come to dwell? The promise is rest. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Surely he will save you from the fowler's sna snare and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his feathers and under his wings you will find refuge. Under his wings you will find refuge. Why? Because his faithfulness, it will be your shield and your rampart. God's word invites us to approach his throne boldly, to receive the grace that we need in our time of need, without timidity, without shame. Why? Because in the presence of, the, of God, we are safe. It is the refuge for our souls. There is, there is nothing about God's presence that will turn away from you or that will shame you, will reject you, will, will, will point a finger at you and say, not now. Everything about God's presence is safe. So therefore, without shame, without timidity, the invitation is come boldly, come boldly and dwell. Sit, stay, rest. You are safe here. Maybe there's some of you this morning that just need to hear that. You are safe here. There's nothing that will harm you in the presence of God. So come, rest, receive. If you're comfortable, would you extend your hands to the Lord once again? And maybe you still have what you were all about this morning before you walked in on the brain or maybe you have what you're going to be all about later today on the brain or later this week on the brain or maybe you're thinking about what you want for lunch already but here's the invitation receive this moment of rest in God's presence be fully present with it because you need it just like the body needs to sleep at night your soul needs to rest in the presence of the Almighty you need to be restored. You need to be healed. You need to be renewed. And where you go for that is God's presence. And that's what this is all about. This is about us coming and saying, we're running. We're running into the shelter. We want to be shielded by the rampart. 
And so that whatever's going on that I'm worried about, whatever those anxious thoughts are, whatever that thing that I is in my life right now that I can't seem to reconcile or, or that relationship that's causing me, me burden or that area of my life just, just feels disconnected from what is good and what's true. The invitation the Spirit of God gives you right here, right now is just come, sit, dwell, and find rest for your souls. So I bless you, church, this morning. Receive it. Open up your hands to the holy God, the one who created you, the one who invites you to come boldly. And I invite you, receive it. Receive it. Receive everything that God has for you right now. God, we thank you for the invitation that you give to every single one of us to come into your presence this morning without fear or worry or a spirit of timidity. We thank you, Holy Spirit, that your banner over us is love. And we thank you that we get to be a part, hear me, we get to be a part of the work of the kingdom here and now. And that is restoration and it's healing. It's life as God had intended for it to be in your life and in the world around us. Thank you for the gift of your kingdom here and now. And everyone says, Amen. Amen. Pray you receive that. Pray you receive that. Because if we receive that, we live as people who are free. And what better testimony, what better witness can we give to the world around us than, than freedom, right? Fe freedom to be loved by God, freedom to love God, freedom to love others without shame, without fear. You know, shame and fear, none of that's ever from God. God created us for freedom. And so I pray you receive that this morning. And hey, I want to thank Zoe Stretch and team for coming and leading us this morning. Such a, such a gift. And uh, yeah, I, I, I tell everybody this and she probably is tired of me saying it, but I've known her since she was born. And so what a gift for us to, to be able to receive her today and see just what God is doing in her life and her like leading us, which is so cool, and her team, and so. How's everybody doing? I want to thank Zoe and the team again for leading worship. Thank you so much for being here. Like Abigail said, we've known, we've known Oscar uh, for about an hour, and Dylan said he and I met at a staff meeting once, um, a vineyard staff thing, so we've apparently known each other for a little bit longer than an, an hour. Um, but Zoe, goodness, I don't know how old Zoe is, but it's going back um, many decades, a few decades now. Um, not a few, probably like two and ish uh, decades now, like Abigail said. I remember being in the small group in a home when her parents announced that they were having a baby, their first. And I remember, I think Cantus might have been in the room as well. 
uh, way back in the day. And so it's such a blessing uh, to be a part of that. And we used to have our staff meetings back when uh, we call it Glendora kind of 1.0. Uh, our staff meetings in uh, Zoe's garage. And I don't know if she remembers that, but she used to wander through as a little, you know, three or four year old in the garage where we would have our staff meetings. And, uh, you know, Apple started in a garage as well. And uh, our current offices are not like that yet. Have you seen uh, Apple's new offices, the big round thing up there in the Silicon Valley? We're not there yet, but um, it's good to be with you and it's good to be together. Well, it is officially summer, right? Uh, Wednesday. Um, how many of you are not ashamed to admit, though, you have absolutely loved this June gloom? You are like, keep the gloom coming. Some of you are like, no, 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 no. Bring on the heat, you know, July. I looked at the weather app, it's coming. By this time next week, July will be here. You can just kind of feel it, can't you? Breathing down your neck. We went for a walk yesterday morning. It was lovely. It was like 67 degrees and sunny. And I said to Abigail as we walk, I kind of feel like this is the last one of like the last weekend where we will be able to walk like this in the, the gloomy kind of cool of the uh, early summer, but it's coming and uh, we'll get there uh, sooner than later. Well, um, speaking of summer, a couple weeks ago we launched our summer series, a brand new teaching series you'll see behind me. This is slated uh, to take us right through summer, kind of right through Labor Day weekend. Uh, we're calling this Songs of Summer. And, and the idea is simply that the songs that we're focusing on are not so much as the summer hits, though we did that a few weeks ago, you may remember. We did a trivia contest with Songs of Summer and gave away ice cream coupons and candy and all sorts of things. Uh, but the songs we're talking about are really, that we're focusing on, are the, the, the 150 songs that we find right smack dab in the middle of our Bibles. Uh, these are 150, like I said, individual Hebrew poems or Hebrew songs we of course call the Psalms. And so while we will not get through all 150 this summer, we've selected a few and we're just kind of sitting with them and allowing them to sit with us and we're praying them as a church. Hopefully you've been praying them. Um, I continue to make this a daily practice of praying through and with one of the Psalms which give us language sometimes when we don't know what to pray. And, 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 and these 150 prayers or poems or songs, they've given the church language for thousands of years. You, know, you, you sit with the gravity of that for me. Like, these have been the prayers of the church for, for over two millennia. And so I find something kind of weighty in that as I pray them and as I, as I read them. That these were, were, were prayed and, and, and have been sung by people before our language even existed, right? These were being prayed, and so we're just kind of letting that uh, sit there. So today, uh, we're going to return to something that we started last week, as it were. Uh, we're going to be in Psalm 8. We started in Psalm 1 a few weeks ago, but I invite you to find Psalm 8. And if you were here last week, we began Psalm 8, and we're kind of kind of sit with it for one more week uh, there, But if you were here, or if you watched online last week, um, hopefully you remember some terms. How many of you remember orientation, disorientation, and reorientation? Does that ring some sort of bell? If you were not here, or you have not yet caught up online, and that's what you're, I know it's what you're planning on doing this afternoon, and you're like, oh yes, I was going to go watch the service from last week online. But we talked about these three words, which are really three categories or three ways to categorize or think about these 150 different poems or songs or psalms that we find in Scripture. Because if you've spent any time with the psalms, you, you, you find quite quickly there's different flavors, right? Some are more upbeat, some are downright depressing, some are victorious, some... Uh, there's a lot of hallelujahs, and some of there is like, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And so you just get all sorts of flavors. And so we categorize these, and I'm totally stealing these from one of the leading Old Testament scholars of the 20th and 21st century, Walter Brueggemann. And we call these psalms of disorient orientation, disorientation, and reorientation. Here's a quick recap of each in case you missed last week. Some of the psalms we call psalms of orientation. What we mean by orientation are these kind of psalms. It's when you read them, you're like, yeah, it's all good, right? 
Everything is good, everything is ordered, everything is as it should be. These psalms tend to uh, affirm the fact that God is firmly in control. It, it, we said last week, these are the psalms where you like have the compass and you know which way is north. You know which way you're going and, and everything. The world is settled, the world is right. Uh, you know which way is north. We said last week, this is that Lexus commercial on Christmas morning with the big red bow where the Lexus is in the driveway and snow is softly alighting on Christmas morning and everything seems perfect and good. Psalms of orientation. But as we know, you don't have to go very far in the Psalms before you get to what we call then the Psalms of disorientation. These are those Psalms, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It all falls apart. God is nowhere to be found, or so it seems, in these Psalms. In these Psalms, the compass is broken or has been lost altogether, right? North is south, up is down. You're not sure, or the author, as we read in some of these prayers, isn't even sure if they're going to make it through whatever they're going through. It's, yeah, somebody on Christmas Eve stole the carburetor out of the Lexus, and everything has been ruined on Christmas morning. And so those are psalms of disorientation. And then finally, we get to Brueggemann's third category, which we call the psalms of reorientation. These are those psalms when it all falls apart, but it's like something's coming back together eventually, right? These are those psalms where it, it appears that maybe God is actually doing something new. Maybe this is a new season I'm entering. Maybe God really hasn't lost control, but maybe um, this is when you're like, oh, I found the compass. I know which way is north again. This is where we should go. This is where things are starting to settle again. And, and you realize, you know what? God is still in control after all, and it's going to be okay. Uh, we found the guy who stole the carburetor in all states covering everything. And so it's like reorientation. It's going to be okay. The car will work once again. How many of you are like, that's life right there, isn't it? Those are the seasons we humans experience as life. Orienta Some of you right now are in orientation. God is in control. God is good. And you had no problem singing your heart out and worshiping today. And some of you are in disorientation right now. You have no idea what, where you're going and where the compass is. And some of us are in a reorienting time. I would argue the last two years uh, of life in the church has been reorientation. We have been figuring out a new kind of normal, and we still very much are. Well, Psalm 8, to go back to where I said we were going to be again, um, Psalm 8's the first category, isn't it? Psalm 8 is a psalm of orientation, and it reminds us, as psalms of orientation do, some things aren't up for debate, Right? Some things are settled. Some things are sure. And these are important because then we can say, so I can build my life on this. This is a certain foundation. This is firm. This is solid. This isn't going anywhere. And this I can build my life upon. So it begins this way. After we spend a little bit of a deep dive figuring out what the heck a gittith was last week. I'll let you watch the video for that one. But the psalm starts this way. Verse 1. O Lord, our Lord... How majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens. If you read the rest of the psalm, which we will eventually today, it actually ends the same way, doesn't it? It ends the way it begins. We call this in the literary word, I think, an inclusio. It's like you begin and you end in the same place. This is meant to remind us, like I said, this is meant to give us full confidence that God is in control, and we are not. His glory is in the skies, in the, the heavens, above it all, as we say, that God is by nature powerful, and God is by nature majestic, and God is glorious. This is very orienting, isn't it? It's very grounding, as it were. That's how this psalm begins, and we said it actually ends the same way. And so what we find here, it's this is like very confident, isn't it? This is a confident declaration that people of faith have, have prayed and declared for thousands and thousands of years. Now, the question then becomes, what gives this psalmist such confidence? What has given them this confidence in this glorious, powerful, majestic God who stands above the cosmos in all creation? If you press a little bit further, and we went here last week, um, apparently... This person, it seems, has been outside on a starry night and simply done what? Looked up. 
That's it. What gave them such confidence to declare that God's majesty, power, and glory sits? They've simply, like you and I, maybe been outside on a starry night, and they just spent some time, as it says here, considering the heavens, which the poet calls the work of God's fingers. And so we did a little bit of that last week. We spent a, a pretty good chunk of time here together doing what the, the poet says, considering the heavens, talking about the, um, the staggering size, right, and vastness of the, the, the cosmos, the nature of the skies above. We did a whole bunch of nerding out last week with astrophysics, and, and, and we were at Men's Grill Night last night, and I totally forgot that my boy Gabe here has a degree in astrophysics from Santa, or Santa, I got it wrong, Santa Cruz. Um, and so we started talking about that, and I'm like, dang it, he should have been standing here doing the little thing I did last week. I'm like, why did that not cross my mind until we brought that up last week? So we spent some time talking about the vastness and the magnitude of the created order, this idea of astrophysics. We looked at some images, remember, from, from that guy, Hubble, and from Voyager 1, uh, which is this space probe, remember, that has been going through the, I mean, through the galaxy, taking pictures and looking at what's out there for 46 years. 1970, September of 1977, this thing was launched, and it's been simply just taking a peek and looking around at how vast in our galaxy, remember, which is one of what we said of over 100 billion galaxies, this one has been flying through one of those galaxies, and we said last week that in 46 years, how far has it got through our galaxy? It is point, what is that? 94 is at thousandths of the way there, meaning it has 99.99 whatever percent to go, just to get to the outer edge of our galaxy. It's been going since 77 at 38,000 miles an hour. Right now, you can go on JPL's website and get real-time data of how this thing is flying as we speak. Now, I have very good news. It ha it's been a week since we talked about that. The percentages have changed. For the last seven days, Voyager 1 has been going at 38,000 miles an hour, taking more pictures. It is now this percentage there. We have clicked up that percentage in the last seven days of getting through our galaxy. Um, right after service, I have to just say, we went, you know, it was Father's Day last weekend, and so right after service, we went out to eat um, in Claremont, and the kids and Abigail gave me some gifts, and I had just talked about all this astrophysics stuff, and I had, I had showed some of my bedtime reading, which was astrophysics for people in a hurry that I'm just finishing up, and it's blowing my mind in all sorts of ways. And then the gifts I got, I want to show you what I got for Father's Day. We are in such alignment here, because one of my kids gives me a brief welcome to the universe, a pocket-sized tour of the galaxy, and Ab did you, this is from you, Abigail gives me 30-second quantum theory which I started last night, and I'll talk a little bit more about this one today, and so they gave me this, and then as we pull in the driveway getting home, Amazon is showing up, no joke, as I'm walking into the house, Amazon guy is carrying a box about this big, and I open the box, and what do you think is in here? Oh, you know it, right? A telescope, and so I got my telescope, and so quick, Poll. How, who thinks that I may have taken this to the youth conference up in Tehachapi where there is no city light pollution and set this thing up and zoomed in on the moon and blown a bunch of young minds who are like, dang, I can see craters. I can see we found the sea of tranquility through this thing on one of the nights up there in the high desert. Um, it was, a, it, was, it was just such a beautiful thing to behold, watching our teenagers all gather around my telescope and me getting to state facts, and then us sitting there talking about how big God is and how vast the universe is at this macro level. And, and so for the writer, back to Psalm, for the writer of Psalm 8, who remember, the writer of Psalm 8 did not have one of these, right? 
had no access to any kind of modern technology, didn't have any of these, had no literature, had no idea. We're talking about a pre-modern mind that simply goes outside on a starry night and looks up. And what they see is mind-blowing. And it causes them once again to do what? Experience God's power and God's majesty and God's glory. How much more? Us, right? Who can look through something like this and behold that same glory. And it led the author then, remember, it led them to a, a bit of an existential crisis, we said. Because what they see after, in verse 4, what they eventually see, and this should pop up, in verse 4, the author then says, oh gosh, what is, what is mankind that you are, are mindful of them? Human beings that you care for them. Because, yeah, you, you can really feel small and insignificant when you behold the power and the glory and the majesty of God, can't you? And, and we, we talked about this, that some of us have had similar moments, maybe that we had on our starry night up in the high desert. I call these those oh dang moments, where you see something so glorious, you oh dang, that is, it's just breathtaking awe-inspiring. We can easily become overwhelmed by our own insignificance. But, and here's where I want to go today, that's not where this poet goes. It'd be easy right now to spend the rest of the, the song talking about, well, I'm just so small, I'm just so puny, I'm so insignificant, I don't really matter, and we can get into that, can't we? And there's, there's some of that. There is a humility that comes to this. There is, when you consider the work of God, there, there is some th those, those moments where it kind of puts life in itself into perspective, but that's not where this poem goes. It's kind of surprising. And so that's where I want to pick up today with the rest of the poem. And like I just said, what we get is a somewhat surprising, and I would say equally profound, theological truth. It is surprising, and yet it is profound. It's the answer to that question. What is mankind that you are mindful of them? Human beings that you care for, him, or for them. Here is the answer, verse 5. You have made them a little lower than the angels, and crowned them with glory and honor. You made them rulers over the works of your hands. You put everything under their feet. All flocks and herds and the animals of the wild, the birds in the sky and the fish in the sea, all that swim the paths of the sea. And here's that inclusio. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Perhaps you noticed that the question, if we go back to the question again in verse 4, there is, a, there is an assumption built into that question, isn't there? And the assumption is this, that the God who made all of that, all that vastness, all that glory, that that God who made the Milky Way that we're .0095 of the way through, and we've been going for 46 years, that that God is mindful of you and I. That that God, the, the, the assumption is, cares for us as human beings. It's like the author is saying, no, 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 no. That's not up for debate. Remember? Orientation. That in itself is settled. But the place that the psalm now turns, it's not so much, like I said, a reflection on our smallness or uh, on our insignificance, which is true at some level, but maybe... The more surprising turn that we see in this psalm is that the psalmist spends the rest of the time, I would say it this way, defining what it means to be human. That's really what it is, isn't it? It is like at an, at an existential level, it is, or you could say an anthropological level, it is defining what does it truly mean to be human. And to that, I want to turn. And so you could say, yeah, yeah, we kind of go from astronomy to anthropology and theology. What does it mean to be human in light of this God? In other words, how does God view us in light of how small and insignificant we really are? And what we get, which is kind of, maybe, maybe it's not surprising, but what we get, there is the smallness, but in verse 5, there is this immediate turn 
what we find actually is a very high and elevated view of what it means to be human. There is like putting things in perspective, but in verse 5, there's this turn, and we find that, yeah, not only does the God who created all of that and a hundred billion other galaxies, uh, not, not only does he care about me, but this God actually has a very high view of me. One way to think about this is that while the majesty at a macro level, while the majesty and the glory of God is certainly out there, and that's not undeniable, right? The psalmist is like, I considered the heavens, it's undeniable, it's settled. While the majesty and glory of God will be on display tonight out there, what can be also certainly true is that that same majesty and glory is seen in here at a micro level. There's the macro level, and then there's the micro level. It is seen all the more in the dignity and the importance that God puts on your life and mine. Because yes, greatness and majesty can certainly be seen in the, the, the largeness of things, right? The grandeur or the vastness of how big things are. But, but can't greatness and majesty be equally seen in the smallness of things, in how intricate and how deliberate and the detail of how small things are? So you've got your astro view, astrophysics, and then you got your what? Now we're talking quantum theory, the smallness of things, the glory and majesty of God revealed in how small things really are. I want you to consider a few pictures, small pictures. So you've maybe seen some of these. I'm going to show you some pictures taken using the electron microscope. Here's some, you try to figure out what this is. All right, we'll, we'll play a little game here. Uh, what is that? A fly eye. That is the, it is an eye. That is the eye of a wasp. That is a wasp eye. Very, very small. Look at the detail in that thing. I wish we had a more... Uh, our, our, Projector here isn't very powerful, but I mean, have you considered the detail of the wasp eye? Dare I say most of you have not today, right? None of you woke up today considering the vastness or the detail of the eye of the wasp. How about this? What is this one? Like, what on earth is that? That is a magnified tail of a shrimp. So that is a shrimp's tail. Uh, there it is. The shrimp tail. Uh, some of you have eaten one of those recently, haven't you? It kind of gives you a new picture of it. I mean, look at the incredible detail, the smallness of the shrimp's tail. Here's another eye. What is this the eye of? Let's see if this, we've got a bit of a delay here on our tech. There it is. Another eye. I mean, look at the, look at the hairs around the eyeball. That is the eye of an ant. So that there is the eye of an ant. I mean, just consider the detail. Sticking with the ant, this is another part of an ant. That's a leg of an ant. So we have an ant leg. Um, okay, I don't think I need to tell you what this is. I just wanted to show you the detail under the electron microscope. A snowflake. I mean, amazing. Some of you are like, no, that's plastic. Someone created that in a factory. No, that's just a snowflake under an electron microscope. Here's one. I like this one. What on earth is that? A blanket? Yeah. No, it's something in... How many of you ate an orange right today on the way up? Anybody get an orange downstairs? Oranges are filled with what? That's vitamin C. I will never eat an orange the same way. That is magnified vitamin C. Look at the... Des Look at the design in it. Crystallized vitamin C. Uh, Gabe, I may have to have you jump on the computer because this thing keeps disconnecting, but let's see if this works. Um, let's try one more. No. Or Wayne. Oh, there it is. Okay, here's, this one's good. <laughs> if anyone guesses this one, we're going to talk afterwards. You're like, what on earth is that? Um, let's see. That is, wait for it, air bubbles from evaporating tequila. <laughs> I 
That is evaporating tequila, an air bubble from an evaporating tequila. Now imagine if one of you shouted that out instantaneously. You knew that. You're like, that's tequila right there. Uh, and we would be like, how did you know? Um, let me see if that's all of them that we have. I think that might be it. All right. We can turn the lights back. Oh, yeah, there's another one. That is, uh, what is that one? That's your brain. That's ne neurons in your brain. That is brain cells. So that is uh, neurons going on inside of your brain. And I don't know if that was the last one. We'll see if anything else comes up here. We got a major lag going on here. Um, we'll just keep it. We're moving ahead. Oh, that one. What is that? That's a cross section of something in your body. That's your artery. That's a cross section. You can see the wall of the artery and that pink stuff, squiggly thing, that's blood, blood cells. So that's your blood. And that is what's keeping you alive right now. Um, or think about when we talk about detail and smallness and intricacy, think about like the world of art, right? The artist. And are not the greatest pieces of art it's like the greatest pieces of art or the greatest artists are known for their attention to what? Detail. Their attention to detail. The smallest stroke or the smallest stitch. And, and, and this, I think, is what the writer of Psalm 8 is trying to communicate. They're trying, when they say, you made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. The glory and the majesty of God. It is certainly set above the heavens, right? But it's also set, did you see, it's set on your head. You're crowned with what? Glory and honor. That it's set on your head. Absolutely mind-blowing. And I think that leads to the question is, how do you think God perceives you? I mean, honestly, how do you, when you woke up this morning and you think of God thinking of you, is that what you're thinking about? That the God who created all of this beauty looks at me and says, but I put, I put honor and I put glory on your head. How do you think God made you? Remember I said, I think this psalm is about what it means to be human. This is essentially what it means to be a human being. Um, you know, contrary to what some of us might think, and I don't know what's coming up there in a the moment, this thing is taken. Oh, we were talking about art. Starry night, right? The intricacies of Starry Night. Abigail, why don't you jump back on the computer because it's doing, it's got a mind of, a, of, a, of its own. You know, contrary to I think what some of us might think, God has a much, much higher view of you than you likely do of yourself. God has a much more elevated view of who you are and what you are about than many of us have been led to believe, or many of us have been told even by others. And you could say that the weight of that kind of glory, if you were to look at it from God's perspective, it's a bit overwhelming if you really stop to consider of it. Now, speaking of the weight of glory, I mentioned last week, C.S. Lewis has a book entitled, with that title, uh, The Weight of Glory. And in there, it's a classic read, I highly encourage you to read it, but in there, he writes this. It's a serious thing to live in a society of possible gods and goddesses to remember that the dullest, most uninteresting person you can talk to may one day be a creature which, if you saw it now, you would be strongly tempted to worship. I mean, that, that, you sit with that thought for a minute. You hear what you, if you read Lewis, it seems that Lewis has been reading Psalm 8 and Lewis has been wrestling with what it means to be made a little lower than the angels. This is a very high view of God. The dullest, most uninteresting person you can talk to may be a creature that if you saw it now, would, you would probably be strongly tempted to worship. How does that change, how does that change the way you view people? The way you view the people you live with or are married to or are parenting or exist with, they, the way that you see them. How does that change the way you look at the people you work with? The next time you walk by Stan's cubicle in accounting and you look at Stan and you see maybe a dull, uninteresting person in your mind, but if you saw them as they truly were, as God intended them to be, a little lower than the angels, as Lewis said, you might be tempted to worship. Crowned with glory and honor. How does that change the way 
you see the person who made your coffee, Barbara the barista at your local Starbucks or whatever, who you run into time in and time out, the way you see your neighbors. Lewis continues in this idea that all are crowned with glory and honor simply by being human, and so it's our job to treat them with the same dignity and honor that they deserve. Lewis continues in the next paragraph, there are no ordinary people. You've never talked to a mere mortal. Nations, cultures, arts, civilization, these are mortal, and their life is to ours as the life of a gnat. But it is a mortal's that we joke with, we work with, marry, snub, and exploit, immortal horrors and everlasting splendors. There are no ordinary people, Lewis writes. There are no mortals. So rest assured, immortals in the room, you are not mortal, you are immortal, and, this, you can, and God has a very, very high view of you, which I hope is good news. Now, there's one more place we need to go in this poem. One more place I want to take it, because it's where this poem goes, and I think it's likely where the original Hebrew readers of this poem, it's where they would have taken it to, as they heard the language of Psalm 8. Because the language we read here, remember, it's all about orientation, right? This is a psalm of orientation. This is about the world as God intended it to be, the settled, uh, setting the record straight. This is about defining what is true, what is right, what is good, what is real. Like I said, it's showing the world as God intended. And the language we read, the glory, the wonder, the majesty, as we go, as we continue through Psalm 8, What I think the original hearers of this poem would have heard echoes to is this is Genesis 1 and 2, isn't it? This this goes right back to the orientation story of Genesis 1 and 2, which is very poetic in and of itself. Because the writer, as you notice, continues to make these very bold, both anthropological and theological uh, statements and claims about what it means to be human. In Genesis 1, 27, the author writes, So God made mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. You see, in the Genesis account, if you go back to Genesis 1 and 2, where does humanity start? At a very low point. Humanity starts as a clod of dust or dirt, right? And you can't get much lower. You think, talk about a low view of what it means to be human. Let's start with dirt. That's where the story starts. The Bible starts with humans as these dirt clods, but then quite suddenly, I would say, there is an exponential elevation of importance as we're told that these dirt clods are breathed into with the spirit of God, the breath of God, and suddenly they become the what? Image of God. You go from dirt clods to image of God in like a verse. This is quite a promotion for you and I, right? We start with this very low view, a little, uh, or and, and then you get this massive promotion to a little lower than the angels, as the psalmist says. And if God is described as glorious, majestic, and we, as Genesis says, are made in the image of this glorious and majestic God, then follow the logic, right? What does that say about you and I? Once again, the psalmist says, crowned with what? Glory and honor and majesty. But here's the thing. And I think this is key. It doesn't just stop with what I would call a divine boost of self-confidence. That's not what today, and that's not what being human is all about. I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't intend this just to be, and hopefully that's one of the unintended consequences. You're like, I'm feeling really good about myself right now. That I'm, Yeah, 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 great, if that's a byproduct. But you can't stop there because the Bible doesn't stop there. If you keep reading in both the Genesis account and the Psalm 8 account, which is a poetic mirror, being made in God's image comes with what I would say both responsibility and a vocation. Because look at the very next verse of Genesis 28. After being told these humans are made in the image of God, 
God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves along the ground. Or Psalm 8 says it this way. What? You made them what? Rulers over the works of your hands. You put everything under their feet. It's the, remember I said it's an echo, isn't it? The writer of Psalm 8 is simply echoing Genesis 1 and 2. Made in the image of God. Crowned with glory and honor. Majestic we are. And then we have a what? We have a royal responsibility. We have a job. We have something to do. And so the important point that we cannot miss, because I think this has everything to do with not only what it means to be human, but also what we're to do with this one human life that you and I are given. And so as we said, yeah, God makes us in his image. True. And that image, if it's the image of God, like we said, is nothing short of, of royalty, right? It's, it's, and then he gives us something to do, something that I would say is befitting someone who's been made in the image of someone who is, who is created in such a royal manner, which means this. It means that the image of God that you and I reflect, or let me add a caveat, or don't reflect, because there is that possibility, right? And that's where Lewis goes if you read The Weight of Glory. Some people are not reflecting the true image of God that they were created to reflect. But here's what this means. The image of God that you and I either reflect or don't reflect is intimately tied to how we choose to live and what we choose to do or don't do with the life that we've been given. Sometimes people are like, what does it mean to be made in the image of God? What does that mean? It has something to do with how we live. That we can actually make choices and live a certain way that more accurately reflects who God is and what God is like in the world. The word used here for what we are to do, you're like, so what are we to do? Well, the word used in both Genesis and Psalm 8, same word, isn't it? It's this word. It's rule. Dominion. There, there's some, you can also find this Hebrew word that is translated dominion. To have dominion. To rule. Which, both of those words are very royal. That's, that's royal language, isn't it? When we think of ruling, when we think of dominion, this concept of ruling or dominion, these, these are royal concepts, are they not? This is what kings and queens do. They, they rule, they, they have a responsibility, they have dominion, they govern, they steward, or you could say it this way, they take care of everything that's been put under their what? Feet. They take care of it. They steward it well. Now historically, we humans, the, the royal track record that we have in ruling and having dominion, it ain't so good, is it? Because at times we choose not to reflect the image of the God who is mindful and who cares about all that he has made. And we choose not to do that. And yeah, you, you can read about some of the biblical kings and very quickly you can see even using some of the kings of the Bible that the way that they rule and the way that they have dominion, it is not to serve the purposes of God and the kingdom of God. It is actually quite the opposite. But we have to remember that Again, this ruling and this having dominion as those made in the image of God, we do so as those who are mindful, those who care, those who take care of, those who steward, those who serve. Psalm 8 then, in line with Genesis 1 and 2, suggests that God shows the high view that he has of, of you and I by giving us what? Responsibility. Responsibility. Something to do with him. That, that yes, he's mindful of us. Yes, he cares for us. But he's given us a significant role to play in his kingdom. This beautiful creation projects. We are made, yes, in his image. And we live 
into that image, I would say, only as we live into that image, as we use the power, the authority, the divinely inspired gifts that God has given us to create what? Goodness and beauty and healing. You could think of it this way, to tend the garden. To tend the garden that he's given us. This is all orientation. This is what it means to be human in the way of Jesus. Think about a child, and I'll close with this analogy. Think of a child, those of you who've raised children, I think of some of our children, who, who watch what their parents do. Maybe it's like you're in the kitchen cooking something, or you're trying to put something together, or you're doing a project, or you're fixing something, or out cutting the lawn, doing yard work. Think of a young child. I know as they grow up as teenagers, you're like, no, they don't do that anymore. But like our four-year-old, if we're in the kitchen cooking, she wants to what? She wants to help. She wants to participate. She wants to be about what the parent is doing. And the same could be true, maybe. I don't know if you're, you're fixing something. I'm trying to fix something. The child will go get a hammer, right? Because I want to participate. I want to help. They want to be involved. They want to roll in the project. They want to roll in the meal that you're cooking. They don't just want to spectate. They don't just want to watch. Now, if all we ever did as parents, if all we ever did was tell our children over and over how mindful of them we are, how much we care about them, that they're beautifully and wonderfully made, which is all true, right? And is that important stuff to say? Of course it is. But imagine if... Our four-year-old wanted to help in the kitchen, and all we did is, is look at her and say, you know, we care about you so much, and we love you so much, and God has, you know, purposes and plans for you so much, but just go sit over there, right? We never involved them. I, I would say that if that's all we do have done, we are missing a significant and important part in their growth and development as a human being. They need what? They need to participate. They need something to do. If they are going to grow and mature and be all who they were called to be, then, then we have to give them responsibility. We have to give them authority. We have to allow them to rule. We have to give them dominion. We have to allow them to participate. And then, as they do, think about the pride that a parent has when they have involved their children in the meal, in the project, in fixing it, in building it, in whatever, and the pride that the parent has of saying, we did this what? Together. This is our God. This is what our God has given us to do. I have created all of this, and I am enlisting you to participate with me in my kingdom, creating something good and beautiful. I think that's the message of Psalm 8. I really do. That the God who affirms who we are, that God then gives us a responsibility and a crucial role to play in his kingdom. And this means that what you and I do with our hands, the work of our hands, right? Like the psalmist said, it, this is the work of the fingers of God. You and I have fingers. You and I work with our fingers. And what this means, if you follow this logic all the way through, what we do with our hands matters. No matter how big it is, no matter how small it is, what we do with our hands has value and it matters. What if we thought about our work? What if we thought about what we use our hands to do each week as an opportunity? Reframe it this way, last thought. What if we thought about it as this? I have the opportunity with the work of my hands to put the majesty and the glory of God on display. Through what, and it doesn't matter what you're doing. You say, but I'm an accountant. Wonderful. I am Stan from accounting. Awesome. Then with your hands, crunch those numbers in such a way and be a kind of person in your company that brings glory and honor to God through what you do with your hands. You see, this demystifies all of this. There is no spiritual work. It's all spiritual, right? No matter what you're doing. So what is the work of your hands? 
What has God given you to do? And what if we thought of it as a way to put the majesty and the glory of God on display? And then take that to our church. What if we looked at our church and the work of our hands that God has given us to do, the way we use our time and our energy and our resources and our gifts? What if we saw it as these endless opportunities to be about the work of the kingdom and as a church together to do what? to put the glory and the splendor and the majesty of God on display for our community. And so, Zoe, why don't you and, the, and your crew come back up. And let's just close this way. I want to close with two simple offerings for ministry. Number one, I, I want you to think of, what is, where is God inviting you to participate as one who reflects his image? Where are you being invited into the kitchen, as it were? Come and cook with me. Come and participate. This is what I've given you to do. Or or maybe think of it this way. What is God inviting you to create? Is there something you're like, no, I've been feeling this for a long time, and I don't know why this is in me, but maybe it's the spark of God in me. I'm being called to create something. Or where is God inviting you to, to serve or to give or to cultivate a relationship with someone, maybe within this church, maybe with our children, maybe with our youth, to to, to cultivate a relationship, to invest such that when you make that investment, the testimony would be where we started, that people would say simply, oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. So I'm going to pray in a moment, and then we're just going to close like we often do with ministry time and inviting prayer. And I want to pray along two lines today. Number one, we want to pray for for anybody here today that you may be struggling with an incredibly low self-image. That all this talk of the glory of God, you being crowned with the glory of God resting in you simply by virtue of you being human, to you that just falls on deaf ears and you have struggled for a long time with an incredibly low view of self. And that may need be worked out of you. They may need some prayer today. And I realize some of you have that because of someone else. It's not you. You were told that for well over a decade. You were told you had, there was a low value placed on you for some of you for decades. And to think that we're just going to snap out of that, like in a few minutes or with the quoting of a psalm, I get that's, that's, that may, there may be, need to be some work done there and some prayer done there and some things broken off some people today. So that, that's the first call. Um, if you just are struggling today with just a, a view of self, that is way, way, way too low. And, and you know it. And, and it's like, I have these thoughts. I look in the mirror and I'm like, it's pointless. I have no idea what I'm doing here. I've lost the compass. I, I don't know, I don't know what, what this is all about. But I'm here and, and we can pray for you. We'd love to pray for you. If that's you. And the second thing is, I'd love, love to pray for those of you who would like the work of your hands simply to be blessed. That whatever has been given you to do with your hands, to reframe that and think of that as, oh boy, I've, I've been, I'm being invited into the kitchen to work alongside the king. Whatever that is. And again, that doesn't matter what it is. But what is God giving you to do with your hands? And you would like that to be blessed. You want to participate in the kingdom work of God wherever that takes you this week. And you just want your hands to be blessed. We'd love to pray over you. Maybe eyes to see the power, the authority that you've been given, endowed on you through the work of your hands. So I'm going to pray, and then we'll, start to, we'll sing a little bit. And if that's you... Uh, we'll, we'll offer prayer. Some of our prayer team will be up here ready to pray for anybody that, that needs it. Let's stand together. So Holy Spirit, we thank you. Thank you for this ancient prayer, this ancient song. The people of faith have been singing and praying for thousands of years. Thank you that it reveals your heart, how you see us, how you created us, what it means to be made in your image, and then the incredible responsibility and vocation that you've given us. So may we live lives worthy of that high calling. May we live a life worthy, not not short selling ourselves, but living up to that the weight of that glory that 
you've placed on each and every person in this room. May we reflect your image to the world and may we reflect it well such that our, our family and our neighbors and our co-workers would look at us and say, Oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. We pray to that end. May we be found faithful of that high, high calling that you've given us. In Jesus' name. We'll be available for prayer. We'll worship together. We'll just see what...